UCLA in biology and his MS and PhD in aquatic ecology. And maybe Jim can say a word or two about that for us from the Utah State University. And currently he's at Northridge, uh, Cal State Northridge, and is the manager of biological collections. So he's keeping with his lifelong bug work collecting. His program today is about encouraging insects in your garden. And um, he'll be showing us images, talk about the benefits. And um, I hope he's gonna talk about how we can maybe control them a little bit more, get them to the right place so they, they don't eat all of our beautiful fruits and flowers. So Jim, take it away, please. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that we'll find out today is that um, one of our themes is, is by having a diverse yard and diverse garden that has lots of different kinds of organisms, including insects in it, you tend not to get um, outbreaks of single kinds that give you um, that give you trouble. So that's one of the one of one of our themes today. But I wanted to start by thanking you for having me to this uh, to this meeting. I actually love these uh, gatherings and and having opportunities to talk to groups like like yours. Um, and uh, we're making the best of it in these days of the pandemic and, and meeting uh, virtually this way. Um, but perhaps we'll get a chance to come back and see you all in person. It's we all know it's much more fun that way. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and I, I could stay and talk, you know, after your meeting for um, a long time about things that are on your mind. And, and uh, it, we have very similar interests. Um, and uh, so that's what we'll be talking about today with respect to um, our gardens. I live in the Eagle Rock part of Los Angeles and uh, I spend most of my, I mean, my wife loves it. I stay outside all day and work in my, uh, work in my yard, my outside projects and, and uh, vegetable gardens and my other gardens and things like that. Um, but recently I've taken to, to doing things in my yard and this is something that other people have done to encourage uh, things in my yard that I like. You know, there are people we like to be around, but there are other organisms we like to be around. And you as gardeners, you like to be around plants for one. I know we have other interests too, but um, you must like plants for some reason. And so we, um, of course, some of them we eat and, or we use for um, cutting flowers and giving to people. But a lot of it, we just, it just makes our yard a nicer place to spend time and to have people um, over to our yards and it makes it a more enjoyable place. But we don't have to stop at um, just plants. And this is something that people have been doing for a while with respect to birds. So let me start um, showing some pictures. So this is one of the things that people encourage in their yards that even just gardeners um, encourage birds in their yards. Many of you probably have hummingbird feeders. Um, it provides a resource that these birds um, like, use, and need, and it encourages them to spend time in your yard. And what you've done is added an element to your, to your yard that makes it um, uh, a better place uh, for you. So this is not something, uh, this practice is not something new. Uh, but why do we have to stop with birds? If you're interested in, in insects and other um, organisms, you can do things in your yard that encourages other kinds of things to visit your yard, spend time there, and make it um, a more um, rewarding place to spend time. And that's what I want to focus on today are um, the kinds of insects that you can encourage to spend time in your yard here in the Los Angeles area in Southern California. Uh, things that you can do to your yard to do that, and some of the benefits that you will reap by um, doing those sorts of things. Now, as gardeners, when you think of uh, encouraging insects in your yard, you're like, oh, what's wrong with this guy? We're trying to, we try to get these insects out, <laughs> out of our yards because we have things like grasshoppers. Um, these are herbivores. They eat plants, and one grasshopper might not eat a lot, but a lot of grasshoppers can uh, eat a lot. I also garden over at my mom's house because she has a nice garden space and uh, good luck growing basil over there. It's grasshopper city. Pretty soon you have sticks. So we just learned not to grow basil over there. 
Um, so sometimes these insects can be a problem, but as I mentioned earlier, there are some of these things that we can do to our yards can make them uh, more uh, diverse and, and uh, verified uh, and, and encourage variety in our yards. And that tends to cut down on outbreaks of single things like um, grasshoppers. One of you already mentioned to me um, aphids, and uh, those are other insects that you might find in your yard that you say, why would we want to encourage these kinds um, of things? Well, if you like aphids, and some people do, um, you might want to encourage aphids, but you might not want that many. Um, when we're done, I'm not real good on advice at get, getting rid of uh, insects, but you can still ask when we're done talking here today, and I'll give you some hints on how I get rid of some things, um, but it's very crude. You don't like aphids, turn the hose on them. <laughs> and uh, you can just use the power of the water or you could just you, you can also use soapy water, things like that. You may not get rid of all of them and it's kind of fun to blast them off the plants, but you can help keep their, um, their numbers down. But there are uh, insects that, that um, can spend time in your yards that might be a little more interesting or more rewarding to you. So we have other kinds of grasshoppers like this gray bird grasshopper. This is the biggest grasshopper that we have around here. And I enjoy seeing this in my yard. I don't have lots of them. I have a few of them. And so we've come to an agreement. I eat some of the uh, turnip greens. They get some of the turnip greens. We share. Um, as long as there's not too many of them, they aren't um, uh, a problem. And I enjoy seeing these things uh, in my yard. There are other qualities that insects can add to your yard that you might not think of. So this is one of our local katydids, Microcentrum rhombifolium. Um, their eggs are gonna start hatching soon. You may not notice them though until the fall or late summer when they start singing. This particular species makes a sound like you know, when you click your fingernail on a comb, it goes tick, 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 so the males are doing this and they're calling females. Well, we have uh, a handful of other species of katydids in the LA area that have their own calls. You encourage these in your yard, you've added sound, song, another element to your, uh, to your yard, be it katydid song or cricket song. Now we're all familiar with those Indian house crickets that have that annoying, this is an introduced species, in the last 20, 25 years here that has that really annoying sound that they like to be in uh, cinder block walls. It sounds like something's wrong with your clothes dryer. Um, so those can be uh, somewhat problematic, but again, that's an introduced species, but we have our native tree crickets here. And these are the nice ones that make summer evenings pleasant by That, that, that kind of sound. So um, by encouraging, we'll talk about what this means, encouraging and how you do that, encouraging these kind of things in your yard, then you get to add this element. It's more of an, an auditory element. You, you may never see these insects, but you hear them and can enjoy them, uh, enjoy them that way. Other services that these insects that you encourage into your yard can perform are things like pest control. So I said a diverse yard um, is, a, is a, a better functioning yard or a better functioning garden. And you tend not to get outbreaks of things that decimate your plants. One of the insects that does this are these flower flies. Um, Kathy mentioned a project at the Natural History Museum that's doing uh, an on, has an ongoing urban biodiversity project that involves citizen scientists and citizen naturalists. And I, I work on this project also, and I, this is one of the families of flies that I um, provide identifications for. So they collect these by the thousands. Um, they have students, mostly from across the street at USC that prepare most of the specimens. And then these flies and crane flies, you know those also, those long-legged flies, the big ones that get in your house. Sometimes uh, they'll come to porch lights and then get in the house and flit around. Um, um, I, I identify all the crane flies and the flower flies for this particular biodiversity project, but they perform services like pest control. So here's a lar there's an adult on the right 
and here's a here's a larva of one of these flower flies eating aphids. Okay, so if you don't like aphids, encourage flower flies in your yard, and they eat aphids, and they eat aphids by the ton. For some species of flower flies, it takes 500 aphids to make one fly. That's a lot of aphids they go through. They literally do they just mow through them, and you have these in your yard, but you might not notice them. They're out and active, not the adults, the larvae are out active at night. If you think you have uh, pl plants that have lots of aphids on there, go out and look in a, with a flashlight and you'll often see these, these uh, uh, predatory fly larvae munching on aphids. Here's an adult of another flower fly that we have here in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles that does this, but also as their name suggests, they visit flowers. Anything that visits flowers um, is potentially moving pollen from one plant to another, from the male parts of one plant to the female parts of another plant, hopefully of the same species, and facilitating pollination. So encouraging insects in your yard can increase pollination rates in your yard, and these are one of the insects that does that, as do bees. This is a European honeybee, another introduced species. These are very common uh, around here. Um, and encouraging these in your yard will help move pollen around for our some of our native plants and many of our introduced plants and many of our plants that we grow in our yards for reasons like in our, um, our uh, vegetable gardens. And then we have literally hundreds of species of native bees, almost all of which are solitary bees um, doing the same uh, sorts of things. And those are also good things to encourage in your yard. Um, one of the reasons being their pollination services. These insects in our yard also uh, function as decomposers like blowflies. And you may have a small enough yard such that if there was a dead cat in your yard, you'd notice it right away and deal with it. But if you have a big enough yard, um, who deals with dead cats? Things like these, like these flies. And they will make a dead cat go away except for some of its skin and hair and, and bones in a, a matter of days. And then lots of them are just downright beautiful. <laughs> we grow plants, some of them, we, I bet everybody in here has some groups of plants that they're more interested in than others. You just like them, you like the flowers, you like the architecture of the plant, you like the way that they smell or, or, or whatever. Um, and, and many of these insects that we have around here are just, um, beautiful and having them spend time in your yard adds something more to your um, yard. This is the, the great purple hair streak. It's larvae feed on uh, mistletoes. So not a lot of us here in the Los Angeles in the city have mistletoe in our yard, but people that live in the foothills might have mistletoe in some of their trees. And that's a food plant for these um, butterflies. Um, Lots of insects are pretty particular about what they eat. You know something about plants, and if you could talk to them, plants don't want to be eaten by insects. So they have come up with um, a whole host of ways to keep from being eaten by herbivores, particularly insects. But insects evolutionarily are pretty smart and have solved some of those plant defenses, but they can't solve all of them. And what that leads to is certain groups of insects can only exploit certain kinds of plants that they have, those plants that they have figured out how to deal with it. So because of this, um, certain plants are only eaten by certain kinds of insects or they're visited by only certain kinds of insects. And that's the basis of one way we can encourage insects in our yards is by providing certain kinds of plants that will encourage certain kinds of insects. If you maintain a diversity of plants in your yard, you will encourage a diversity of insects in your yard. Um, and you don't have to go out and buy these insects. They're out there. All you have to do is provide something, some resource, something that they like and would use, and they will find it. I don't even care if you have one plant. They will find it, and then they will spend time near that plant, on that plant, in your yard. So that's the basis of encouraging not just insects, but other organisms into our yard if you provide something that they like, okay? So if you grow uh, passion vines, 
you get this butterfly here. This is called the Gulf fritillary. And what you're providing is not so much a nectar source for these butterflies, but a food source for their larvae. That's the only kind of plant that the larvae of this butterfly feeds on. Females that have mated fly around, look for and smell these plants, mostly using their antennae, and they lay eggs on there. And now you get these butterflies um, in your yard. So this has led to something called butterfly gardening. This is not taking butterflies and planting them in rows and uh, watering them and hope they come up. This is what I was just talking about, encouraging these plants in your yard, both food sources for their larvae or nectar sources for the adults. The butterflies will find your yard and spend time there. This is not my yard, by the way. <laughs> um, we will see my, art, my yard later. It looks nothing like this. This is really nice. They have um, gardens like this at the Natural History Museum that are in virtually downtown Los Angeles. And um, by growing plants in a relatively small area, it has become a very diverse um, and uh, interesting place to visit because of the plantings and the associated insects that have found those plantings. So if you're interested in butterflies, you can plant certain plants and encourage those butterflies in your yard. I'm more interested in little beetles and flies. And so I do what I call insect gardening and, and uh, plant things that encourage those other kinds of insects in addition to um, butterflies. So we can grow certain kinds of plants like uh, some grasses in our yard and you'll get this caterpillar here. A lot of us call this a woolly bear caterpillar. Um, and then these things grow throughout the summertime feeding on the grasses. They go down into the soil and pupate. And from that pupa in the fall comes this moth. I think this is the most beautiful moth that we have here in the Los Angeles area. It's called Arachnus picta, um, the painted arach uh, arachnus. But by encouraging the food plants of this moth in your yard, you will get to have this moth in your yard. And you mostly see this when it visits porch lights. Um, outside your outside your house, but only if this moth is, is living in your neighborhood. If you grow plants like fennel, okay, so here we pick the plant, we plant this plant, you can even have one of them, and the insects will find it like the larva of this swallowtail butterfly here. This is Papilio zelicaon, the anise swallowtail, which pupates and turns into this butterfly. So you're encouraging this particular species in your yard by growing that one particular species of plant. And then of course, we all know about growing milkweeds in our yards. If you grow milkweeds in your yards, this, this plant has some great defenses about to not get eaten. It has uh, physical structures like little hairs on its leaves that make it difficult for herbivores. But most importantly, it produces some really nasty chemicals in its bodies that it can pump into its leaves um, that, that make it inedible for most things, including us. Go ahead and eat, make a salad out of milkweed. Ugh. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know how much of it you could eat, but if you force yourself to eat a lot, I guarantee you, you're gonna get sick. But some insects have figured out how to deal with these defenses. And that's the only place that you find them. That's all they can eat are milkweed plants. So if you grow milkweeds, you get this butterfly larva, this is a monarch, okay? Again, you can only have one of these plants in your yard. A female monarch will find it. She will lay eggs there. You will get these caterpillars, which pupate and become these adult uh, monarch butterflies, okay? And then there are other insects that have figured out how to deal with milkweeds, like milkweed beetles. So here's a pair of them. They're, one of their strategies is they, before they start feeding on the leaves, is they go down here to the, um, the, this petiole here of the leaf and they chew into it and they, they cut through the, the tubes that this plant would use to move fluid out to the leaves. And then when they start chewing on the leaves, this plant can't pump those nasty chemicals out into the, into the leaves and they can um, feed upon these leaves. They can also deal with some of those um, chemicals that, those, that are produced by those plants. And then, of course, you will also get small milkweed bugs, and you'll get large milkweed bugs. These are 
two different species of insects. The adults can fly, and so they, that's how they find the milkweed plants um, in your yard. And then if we're planting plants not so much as food sources for the vegetation, but as nectar sources, we can plant plants that have flowers that are very open and not very restricted to what kind of things can visit them. In a minute, we'll talk about other kinds of flowers that are very restrictive about what can visit them. But open flowers like, um, this is a cactus. So you plant a cactus when it gets uh, big enough, it, it will flower. And uh, it has all these structures out here that look kind of like uh, petals and, and sepals. We call them tepals. And they have lots of anthers in here producing, uh, producing pollen. And lots of insects will exploit the pollen like these nitidula, little sap beetles. So I said, I'm interested in flies and beetles. And so this would be something I might grow in my yard because I know these kinds of insects will show up and then I will get to see them. And for me, that's an enjoyable element in my um, garden. And then other open flowers are things like our, uh, this is calicortis. Um, we have some native species, many native species of this here in Southern California. These are um, uh, lilies. And uh, this is a very open flower. And so things like large bees can get to the nectaries and can get to the anthers and collect pollen. So I mentioned that there are hundreds of species of, of native solitary bees here in, in our area. And this is one of them in the genus Centris. And this is a female and she's been out collecting pollen that she carries in these specialized hairs on her legs. And, but she's also gathering um, nectar. And what she does is goes and uh, some of these native bees nest in the soil and dig tunnels in the soil. Others burrow into wood like carpenter bees or they exploit pre-existing holes. And the females do all the work themselves and gather nectar and pollen and go into these tubes and make a ball out of nectar and pollen and lay an egg on it and then block it off and go away and die. And that egg that they lay hatches into a, a larval bee that feeds on those food resources and then pupates and makes a new bee and uh, starts the next uh, generation. But some of these very open flowers, if you grow those, you will encourage these bees in your yard. And if you have a vegetable garden that, re that really requires, uh, in some cases, bees to visit these, these flowers, you're using one plant to encourage these bees to spend time in your yard, and then they will also visit um, other plants in your yard and you will get some benefit out of it besides just seeing and experiencing these, um, these bees. And then some of the uh, very open kinds of flowers are, are uh, things in the family Asteraceae, uh, daisy kinds of flowers. Um, this is really an inflorescence made up of hundreds of flowers, but it's very open. It's not hard to get to the nectaries or to the, um, to the pollen. So here's a bunch of little beetles. These are carpet beetles. Now these you might not want in your house because the larvae eat wool. So if you have a, a, a wool, a wool suit or wool carpets, those larvae will um, eat those. They can be somewhat pestiferous, but the, the adult beetles are kind of handsome looking things, quite small, but um, handsome looking uh, beetles and, and uh, fun to see. But these very open um, Asteraceae are, are great things to plant and have in your yard because lots of things can, um, can get to them, including flower flies um, that we, we've talked about already. And so, nectar sources can encourage these flies in your yard and then they will be close by when the females are ready to go lay eggs they'll go search for aphids so i've watched them going up to plants and they will they will visit a stem of, of plants and they will fly up and down examining stems of plants looking for um, aphids when they see enough aphids that's where they lay their um, eggs and they will keep aphid numbers down in your yard so if you have problems with aphids, flower flies are good things to encourage in your yard to cut down on uh, harmful numbers of aphids. Lots of wasps are able to visit um, these big open asteraceous flowers, and some of those actually can also function as pollinators. You can see inadvertently this wasp has picked up quite a bit of, uh, of pollen already and may move this to another um, 
another inflorescence. And then of course, we've already talked about butterflies and butterfly gardening. Plants in the family Asteraceae um, are great nectar sources for lots of butterflies. This is a, a, a pygmy blue that we have. It's a very common butterfly here in Los Angeles. If you have the right plants in your yard, guaranteed you will see this um, butterfly. Sometimes this is either tied for or is the smallest butterfly in the world. And we have it right here in, uh, in Los Angeles. Other kinds of plants that are great nectar sources for that, that are not restrictive and, and lots of generalist flower visitors like this swallowtail butterfly are areognops. So some of you may have gardens where you, you really like to encourage or have native plants. Um, there are lots of non-native plants that can do these jobs, but some people want to deal with native plants. So areognums are great uh, native plants, California native plants that encourage um, uh, insects to visit them to gather, um, to gather nectar. So, and that includes not just butterflies, but wasps like this paper wasp here. It's real easy to get to the nectaries of these, these flowers. So they're not restrictive to the kinds of things that can visit them. And little beetles, like I said, that, that uh, one of the groups that I'm interested in, like this little uh, red-shouldered leaf beetle and flies. Again, I like beetles and, uh, and flies. This is a canopid fly. And you can see its mouth parts here pointing they're very elongated in this, in this fly. They um, use these long mouth parts to probe down deep into flowers to get to, the, uh, to get to the nectar. Then there are a whole host of other flowers that are pretty restrictive as to what can visit them because of their, um, the flower morphology. And here, instead of one plant like a, a, a daisy attracting lots of different kinds of insects, Many of these kinds of flowers, as far as nectar sources, only attract very limited kinds of things. So this is a lupin. We have left, we're talking about native plants again, that we have lots of native lupins. These are beautiful plants in their own right, but they also have visitors that come to these flowers, but they're hard to get to. These are, um, if you're familiar with a uh, sweet pea flowers, um, if you're not familiar with lupins, these are the same kinds of flowers. These are peas and, and beans. And it can be hard for insects to get to the nectaries. You almost have to open them up. But big bees can do this. So bumblebees are something that can visit um, lupin flowers. And those would be good bees to encourage in your um, yard. Also flowers in, in uh, the family Lamiaceae, the mints. This is a native plant here, um, Trichostema, uh, woolly blue curls. And you can see that these are fairly restrictive flowers. They're, they have um, long, narrow tubes. So insects that are small or have long mouth parts can uh, exploit these, but only those kinds of insects can get to the nectaries on these, um, on these plants. Um, this is an extreme case of, this is not from here, but this is an extreme case of plants being very restrictive as to what can visit them. So this is a South African plant here with extremely long floral tubes and the nectaries are way down here. And it's very dependent upon a particular fly, this fly here in the family Nemestrinidae that has very long mouth parts. In a sense, these two, this plant and this fly have entered into um, a, a cooperative arrangement um, where this plant depends on this fly for pollination. And this fly depends on that plant for its, its food. And they go through evolutionary time together. The only problem with that is you imagine if you get rid of the fly, the plant goes extinct. You get rid of the plant, the fly goes extinct. So it's not a great long-term arrangement, but on a short-term arrangement, it's very efficient because this fly is going to go to another one of that same species and so you're gonna efficiently move pollen from one individual of your species um, to another. But this is an example of how some plants can be very restrictive as to what um, can exploit them. And because of that, you can manipulate what insects you have in your yard by the kinds of plants that you grow or encourage in your yard. 
Here's some other um, somewhat restrictive flowers. Here's a bombelid fly visiting this flower here. She's going down in here, um, or he's going down in here to pick up um, nectar, but he's also picking up uh, pollen off of these anthers to move from uh, flower to flower. And then we talked about uh, bumblebees. As a group, bumblebees are a, a group of our native bees that aren't doing so well these days. So one of the things you can do by encouraging these things in your yard is not just to derive enjoyment for yourself or visitors to your garden, you can also help encourage the propagation of uh, taxa of insects that are uh, not doing so well. So some of the, there are actually endangered species of bumblebees, threatened species of bumblebees. Because the landscape has changed so much, they're not able to exist in um, as great a numbers as they did in the past, but um, people even in fairly small backyards can um, encourage the existence of some of these um, groups of insects, particularly um, bumblebees. The other thing that you can do in your yard or to keep in mind when you're manipulating the plants in your yard with the idea of manipulating the organisms coming to your yard is not just the kind of plant um, with respect to what species it is, but also the architecture of the plant. So a big plant is very diverse and can encourage lots of different things, but also within your yard, if you encourage small plants, medium-sized plants and large plants, what you're doing is creating a lot of physical heterogeneity in your yard, okay? And that begets other kinds of biological heterogeneity, not just with the plants that you're planting or encouraging or maintaining, but also the insects that visit your yard. A physically heterogeneous yard begets biological heterogeneity. Okay, and so in this drawing just shows you some different kinds of plant architecture. And if you have a yard that's big enough, um, this would be the way to go. Maintain small, medium, and large kinds of plants. Even a single large, even if you have a really small yard, a single large plant can provide resources and habitat for lots of kinds of insects. So this, here is one of our native plants in the genus Ceanothus. A single plant here, um, can serve as a food source for many kinds of herbivorous insects. It could serve as a nectar source for flower visitors. Also look down here in the leaf litter. Okay, there are dead parts of this plant. This encourages the existence of other kinds of insects, such as things that feed on ceanothus. Like this is uh, a ceanothus silk moth. We have um, here in, in uh, the Los Angeles area, two, two native, very large, most of the adults about the size of a, of a slice of bread, um, native silk moths here in Los Angeles. And this is the Ceanotha silk moth, um, Hyalophora urealis. And this is what the larva looks like. They eat Ceanothus bushes. They'll also eat um, laurel sumac. We talked about eating milkweed and you'll get sick. Um, if you made a salad out of it, uh, you could make a salad out of laurel sumac too, and you ain't going to get very far eating that. <laughs> it's awful. But these things have figured out how to um, uh, deal with those. And this is the moth that it turns into. If those of you that live in the foothills around here, um, in early in the spring, uh, or early, yeah, like, kind of out later in the spring, in about a month or so, these things will show up at, at porch lights. Again, this is a big moth. So this is one of the two big, big, really big moths we have here in the Los Angeles area. But under single large shrubs, you'll, you'll get things like darkling beetles, like this um, beetle in the genus Eliodes, that many of you, if you go hiking the trails around here, um, you will see these beetles. Um, they like living in, in leaf litter under shrubs. Um, we also have fireflies here in the Los Angeles area. Under shrubs is a great place for these kind. These are also beetles and they make light. We have fireflies that make light here in Los Angeles. We just don't have fireflies that make light and fly at the same time like we have in the Eastern United States. I hope many of you 
in your experiences through your life have had the chance to go to the eastern United States and see real fireflies flying around because it's the closest thing to magic that exists, I think, on Earth. And if you haven't, um, add that to your list of things to do and uh, go someplace in the east in the summer and see real fireflies. We have them here. They just sit on the ground when they make light. And other, uh, not just insects, but insect relatives like millipedes that, live, that like to live in the leaf litter and feed on mold and fungus and, and decomposing plant matter under shrubs would be encouraged by such um, large plants. Other things that you can do to your yard, if your yard is big enough, you can add things to it besides plants, like water elements. Hey, you go, hey, this looks fancy. Again, this is not my yard. This is a this also almost looks like a nursery. Um, but if you add a water element to your yard, you will encourage insects that um, spend parts of their time, their lives in the water. When I, I, you mentioned, I went to graduate school at Utah State University and my graduate degrees are in aquatic ecology. So I study the ecology and, and mostly the community ecology of running waters. Um, and there are a whole host of insects, that's where they live. They live in water, okay? So if you have a yard where you can even add the smallest of water elements, you will get things, you'll get mosquitoes. I like growing mosquitoes and then I dump them out before they get to be an adult. I just like looking at them, but um, I, my wife gets mad, but that, a bucket or two, it's not that bad. And then just dump them out before they become adults um, because they can be problematic as adults. And we have a, a few new mosquitoes here in Los Angeles and uh, like 80s Egypti, the yellow fever mosquito and 80s Albopictus, the, um, it's a oriental tiger mosquito. I've got both of those in my patio in my yard in Eagle Rock and that 80s Egypti is awful. Um, it, it is in the process of changing how us folks in Los Angeles use our outdoors in the summertime. Uh, because they bite in the heat of the day, doesn't matter day or night, they'll bite. They bite you down and lower on your legs, and uh, they're relentless. They're relentless things, and they can breed in almost no water. The point here, though, is if you add water to your yard, aquatic insects will find it, and they will reproduce there. So you will get things like mosquitoes, but you'll also get um, more enjoyable things like um, damselflies. So this is an adult damselfly. The larvae are aquatic predators. If you have a mosquito problem, if you have damselfly larvae, they will eat mosquito, uh, mosquito larvae, as will the larvae of larger things like dragonflies. Even swimming pools attract uh, dragonflies. Now they don't reproduce there because the water is chlorinated and there's no prey for them, but the adults will lay their eggs in swimming pools, but in a smarter, smaller water element that has things for them to eat, they will, the adults that fly will find those places, they will lay their eggs there, and you will get um, uh, these reproducing. And we have a small pond on campus, and there's tons of dragonflies flying around this, this pond and reproducing there. This is one of our local species. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful insect and to have spend time in your yard. And you will get uh, other aquatic uh, beetles like whirligig beetles and uh, water striders. Again, the adults of these things can fly and they will find these water sources. You can also maintain uh, compost piles. So I, this is one of my compost piles. I have three or four compost piles. And uh, that's a, that's, a different kind of resource that you can put in your yard that encourages other kinds of insects. So I get these beetle larvae in my compost pile. And uh, I've always thought of putting a bunch of these on a skewer and putting them on the barbecue because they're so big. <laughs> they look like they might be good. Um, I've eaten lots of insects, but I haven't eaten, I haven't tried these yet. They're a little too big and maybe mushy, but one of these days I'll try so that I could tell you how they, uh, how they taste, but they, those, those larvae consume the compost and they turn into this. So this is a beetle that most of you are familiar with, probably, especially out there in the Burbank area, late in the summer, early fall, you see this green fruit beetle flying around. 
This is the larvae of it. They, they have reproduced in decomposing uh, plant matter like a compost pile, pupated, and they turn into this, okay? What ha usually happens in my yard is when these things get nice and big and juicy like this, then the, I think it's the skunks, but also I got possums and raccoons, they hit that compost pile, they tear it up and they get most of them. So in some ways you're kind of encouraging those mammals in your yard by having a compost pile, which makes these, which encourages skunks in your yard. So if you like skunks, do that. Um, other things that you can do is, is provide other resources for insects. So um, you can provide food for adult butterflies, not just nectar sources, but lots of butterflies like rotting fruit. So that's what this is. It's a little rotting fruit station. This doesn't work very well here in Southern California, but in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, this is a great way to attract butterflies. They love rotting, rotting fruit. Or little places like, these are little houses. Um, these things exist for bats too, little places where bats can overwinter. But some of our butterflies also overwinter as adults and providing a little um, place where they can be secluded and out of the element will encourage them to spend time um, in your yard. I make these things too. These are, I call them bee houses and they're, there, you could be the day one of carpentry and you can make these. It's just a piece of four by four with holes drilled in it. And leaf cutter bees use these holes. Remember I talked about some of our native bees use pre-existing holes. I'm just providing these holes for them. These bees find this, they spend time in your yard visiting your flowers. Then they also cut leaves that they use to plug these holes. So you can see Every one of these plugged holes is filled with a ball of, 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 of pollen that's glued together with some nectar with an egg on it. And then there's multiple of those in, in this um, long tube that's been drilled here. And they're called leaf cutter bees because they cut little pieces of leaves and use that to plug the hole. And then the female does all this work. The male, is, he's made it and gone his way. He does provide any assistance at all. She does all of this and then goes and dies and never sees her kids that um, form the next generation. So I just make these and hang these under the eaves of uh, say your garage or something like that. And it really can be a hub of activity, of, of activity in your yard. And I've got, sometimes there's just bees flying all over this. And then I've had parasitoid wasps that land on here and drill through the wood and lay their eggs and parasitize the bees. And then spiders figure out that this is a hub of insect activity and they make their webs around here. So just a simple block of wood with holes drilled in it can increase the insect diversity in your yard. And this is one of those um, leaf cutter bees. And these don't carry pollen around on their legs. They carry it down here on a patch of specialized hairs called a scopa and leaf cutter bees jam pollen in here. That's how they use, that's their shopping bag that they use to get pollen and carry it around to fill those tubes. And just, this is my yard. See, it doesn't look as fancy as those other ones, but just having wood piles, if you have a yard, large enough um, yard and a, a spouse or partner who doesn't care if your yard looks like heck, you um, maintain wood piles. And so I maintain wood mostly for, I, I barbecue a lot on and, and use wood. So I have piles of wood, but just dead plants can encourage things like beetles that feed on decaying wood. This is a, one of our biggest beetles we have around here, Prionus californicus. And uh, these can be quite common here in Southern California and their larvae feed on wood that's breaking down. Um, so, and this is a this is a big beetle. This would be a nice insect to see in your yard. We have some other related things like this um, poplar longhorn beetle. This is this is one of the most beautiful beetles I think we have here in uh, Los Angeles. And I've had people call me on the phone from right here in the San Fernando Valley um, where I work, and they find these beetles and they want to know what is it? What does it do? Well, it that's from some tree probably in their yard. I had some woman one time called me and said, I found this beetle and it looks like a cow. And I'm like, what the heck are you talking about, lady? Beetles don't look like cows. And I thought for a little while and I said, 
you know, I bet I know what that is. And I went to her house and picked it up and this was it. In a way, it has a pattern of one of those of a milk cow <laughs> in color. Of course, it's not the size of a cow, but I could see where she was coming from. So um, that's one of the things I do with my job a lot. People call me on the phone or now, since everybody has a cellular phone or almost everybody, they take pictures and send me pictures of things and they wanna know what it is. What does it do? Does it bite? Does it sting? Is it a good thing in my yard? So you all are welcome to do that, um, to do that too. And uh, I think Kathy has my contact information and you're welcome to get that um, from her and uh, uh, ask your questions. I love figuring things out such as a beetle that looks like um, a cow. These also showed up on our campus one year by the, the dozens when they repainted the tennis courts. There was something in the paint, you know, like paint has uh, chemicals in it. Some of it is similar to the chemicals that's in decom like turpentine in decomposing wood. So these chemicals were saying to the world, here's a bunch of dead and dying wood. It was paint, but that's what the beetles read and they showed up at the tennis courts looking around for dead wood, but all they find is, is, uh, is concrete. Wood piles have other kinds of beetles like jewel beetles. This is one of our local, this, this is a beautiful beetle just in and of itself. Um, but also things that nest are native bees that don't nest in pre-existing holes, but make their own holes like carpenter bees. That's why they're called carpenter bees. They drill their own holes. Okay, this is a male of the valley carpenter bee. Uh, they're orange and that you're familiar with the females, they're all black. They drill into wood and do the same thing, make a ball of pollen and nectar, lay their eggs, block it off, make another one, make a whole tube out of those things to make new bees for the next generation. And then wood piles beget other non-insects like spiders. This is our Western black widow. You can recognize black widows, that's just one of the, few spiders I can identify because <laughs> they're so distinctive. You can even recognize them almost by touch. Their webs are very crude, but tough, almost like steel wool. And uh, so this is a native widow that we have here, but we also have now the uh, invasive introduced brown widow, which if you want to see one of those, go in your backyard, find the patio furniture, turn it over and look under it, and it's going to be there. <laughs> they're all over the place now but they also would like places like uh, wood piles. This butterfly here, the morning cloak, morning, not M-O-R-N, like the daytime, morning, M-O-U-R-N, like somebody uh, mourning the death of, of a loved one, um, a morning cloak that somebody might wear. That's the name of this butterfly. And you see these in the winter and the real early spring, and you go, how did those things reproduce so fast? They didn't. These butterflies overwinter as adults. Where? In wood piles, in brush piles. And so if you have those kinds of habitats in your yard, you will encourage these butterflies to spend time in your yard and they come out real early. Um, and then they, they, one of the plant, they eat a whole host of plants. They're fairly generalist, but one of the things they like is, is elm trees. You know, we have introduced like Chinese elm trees and that's what they, they um, feed upon. And they can be common things in your yard. Even something so simple as a piece of wood on the ground in your yard will encourage insects because that's where they live. They live under bark, they live under boards, they live under rocks. So something is just leaving a piece of wood on the ground, you turn it over, you find things like earwigs. Now this is an introduced species, but they're behaviorally interesting. They have parental care. Here's a female um, taking care of her eggs and her and her young. If you have flower pots sitting in the dirt, turn them over around here. This earwig lives under flower pots and rocks. But also other non-insects like centipedes. A board in the yard, give it some time, you will find uh, centipedes. And things like isopods. Uh, sometimes we call them roly polies or pill bugs. Um, those live under rocks and logs. And then the last thing. We've manipulated things in our yard that begat certain insects. Well, sometimes these insects and arthropods of themselves beget something else that feeds upon them. So we have these isopods here that can roll up into a ball and almost nothing can, that small can eat them. But this spider here 
um, is a called sow, a sow bug killer. The calissary or the fangs on this spider are right here. They are huge. They go right through the carapace of those isopods. Doesn't bother them at all. And so when you find one of these under a board, you usually find these dried out mummified corpses of um, pill bugs next to this spider. So we've done something to our yard that encouraged one group of organisms that in it, in turn, it encouraged another group of organisms, notably predators like this spider on those sow bugs and other predators like, so these aren't in your yard to visit flowers. These are in your yard eating other insects. So here's one of our local um, uh, mantis. This is Stagmo mantis limbata. These are cool. I mean, uh, praying mantis are just cool insects. They make great pets too. Catch one, keep it inside, feed it flies, feed it insects, watch it. They're um, amazing, amazing things. And other kinds of, if you like flies, you don't just attract flies that visit flowers and visit plants, but by having lots of other insects in your yard, you will attract predaceous flies like these. These are robber flies. People have started calling these assassin flies now, and I think that's actually a better name. They don't rob anything. They kill things and eat them. So assassin fly is a better word. Neither one of them is nice. <laughs> um, and here's, here's those flower fly larvae that I talked about. This is one from, from my yard that I watched mow through a dozen aphids. The aphids stood there like, like sheep in a pasture and a wolf just coming up eating one at a time. They didn't even bother to leave. They just stood there and this fly would rear up glomp down on one, turn it up, and then go, 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 and get another one. So like I said, they will mow through hundreds of aphids. And ladybird beetles, this is the larva of a ladybug. Um, and these are predators. So if you don't like aphids or you don't like small insects that you may um, consider a pest in your yard, one thing to encourage are predators, parasitoids. And ladybird beetle larvae are great predators on some of those um, insects. And spiders, you will encourage spiders that are there not feeding on the plants directly, but feeding on the insects that are there to visit the plants, like this crab spider, this yellow crab spider that just sits on flowers and waits for things to visit flowers like this, this honeybee. Now, it can't eat the, that whole bee, but um, it certainly has killed it and will uh, eat to its fill. And you don't just encourage invertebrate or insect predators, you also encourage vertebrate predators like lizards. I, the house I live in now is the house I grew up in. We never had these Western fence lizards until the last six or seven years. Now I have probably hundreds living in my yard and reproducing there. I think, I don't know why that is. Um, but I think it has something to do with coyotes, which eat the neighborhood cats, which used to eat these lizards. Okay, so as growing up, I used to see tons more stray cats. Now I see coyotes in the neighborhood. In fact, we two nights ago we had a bear in our neighborhood, which I I have never heard of. And I'm in live I live in the city. Um, and that so. Encouraging insects encourages other predators, including vertebrate predators, including birds, which is where we started with and our, our first, first picture. So if you like birds or if you like birds and plants, these insects can serve as an intermediary to encourage those also. So we can provide nectar sources for hummingbirds, but lots of insects for things like flycatchers like this, um, like this, black, this black Phoebe. I wasn't able to see any of your chat because when I share my screen, I can't see any of the chat stuff. But we can deal with questions now and we okay. can deal with your, you can pick the questions or people can, whatever you think works. Okay, Jim, um, I'm gonna jump in here and go through the chat questions. And once I've done that, I will unmute everyone and if you have time, we can take their spontaneous questions. So I'm gonna go backwards. Marlene has asked you, uh, how do you get rid of roly polies? And then right after 
she asked that question, you showed that spider. So she also wants to know that spider's name. Okay. Um, should we get rid of roly polies? And if so, how? Um, I'm all, I'm kind of against the notion of getting rid of anything. Yeah. Now, some of those roly polies are, are introduced species, but we live in Los Angeles. Go outside and look around. Almost everything is introduced. So um, these things aren't going away. And so if you wanted to make your yard free of those things, I think you would have to pesticide the heck out of it. And I don't think you would want to do that. Because um, we'd probably but, kill a lot of other beneficial yes. things. Right. I mean, you guys are, we're all, we're gardeners. We, we could get rid of these things if we concreted our yard. And, and even then you would still have in any object laying on the concrete, roly polies would get um, under those things. But that's not what we're, that's not what we're interested in. I think we like living things. We like um, life. And so I would encourage um, finding ways to, to coexist with some of those things. Now, if you really don't like them, you would have to minimize the uh, kind of things that they like, like boards on the ground like um, rocks laying around on the ground. Because if you have lots of those, you'll have lots of, um, lots of pill bugs. If you have fewer of those, you'll have fewer pill bugs. Um, so but, what, yeah. What is the name of that um, really pretty orange spider that oh, eats okay. them? Okay. Um, a common name for it is, is a uh, sow bug killer, but, <laughs> but its real name is Distera crocata. I'll spell it. And I think I can get it right. D Y S D E R A. Next word C R O C A T A. If I missed a letter, if you look that up, you will see it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, going I would be careful. I would be careful picking those up because the the what's called the calissary, the fangs on that spider are so big that. I've never, I've never been bitten by one of those, but mechanically, forget any venom, it's got to hurt. Okay. So <laughs> I, I'm not picking it up. Well, I'm certainly never going to kill one yeah. because they kill sow bugs. Yeah. But see, that's an introduced spider too. So they came together. The yeah. predator and the prey um, both got here and, and both exist here. Yeah. Now, those um, Ceanothus silk moths, um, do we use that silk? It, are they used commercially or even ho by hobbyists to create silk? You could, and people have used, um, particularly indigenous folks from around here have used those, uh, their cocoons for things like that. It's not, as, it's not near as good. And people have tried it in the Eastern United States. In the Eastern United States, we have even more species of native big silk moths. And people have tried that. And it's really not as good as the only truly domesticated insect is the silk moth that, that people developed in China. And that's really the one that, that works, the, works the best. Okay. But you, you could, you, I, I don't, I just don't think they're, they're as good, but it's the same thing. It still makes a cocoon made out of a single long, very long thread of silk. And you take that and you put that in really warm water and then you unwind it and you get this really long, super thin thread of silk. You got to take a bunch of those and wind them together to make a thread that you could weave to make something. So if you have a, a silk tie or a silk shirt or something, that's a lot of moths. A, wow. a lot of pupae went into making that. Yeah. Okay. Another question for you. Um, Anne asks, she says, I have a bee house with long wooden cylinders, but no bees. How can I encourage them to the bee house? Yeah, I, um, somebody gave one of those to my mom. And it, they're, they're, their holes are too big in the one that, that she got. Um, and so the, the bees that we have here don't like it. Now, I know somebody else that had one of those in their yard um, here, I think, in the South Bay area. And it was small pieces. They were pretty big size. I didn't think they would get bees. But, but one kind of bee started using that in, in, in her place. 
So one thing I would encourage is maybe try something with smaller holes. The, when I make my, those bee yes. houses, the biggest holes I make are a quarter of an inch. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. And, and some years it's great. And in other years, nobody shows up. I'm like, Hey, what did I do different? Yeah. <laughs> is it me? <laughs> yeah. And, it, and I don't know. Um, this might be something that you could do some research on. I don't know what's the best, say the side of the house. Do you want that thing to get a lot of sun or a little sun? Do you, and I try to keep mine out of the rain. Um, but there's probably, and probably people know some um, good orientations for them around here in Los Angeles. But I have done it and it, and it just, just filled up. Okay, the, you know, yeah, food. it looked like it did. Yeah. Uh, Rosalia would like to know if milkweed bugs sting. No. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> now, don't eat them because Ooh, almost yeah. all of those insects that have figured out how to eat milkweed also incorporate those nasty chemicals in their own bodies. And you noticed how those milkweed bugs were red and black and very colorful. They're not trying to hide. If you translate what they're saying to you, it is leave me alone don't eat me, you'll regret it. And that's what they're telling you. And they're telling you the truth. Some insects mimic those things and they're lying to you. You could eat them, but they're saying they're bad. But those are telling the truth. If you ate, just, I mean, it's not going to kill you. Pick one of those milkweed bugs, eat it, and you will spit it out and go, this thing is awful. And you won't do it again. I they have, don't stink. okay. I have one more question in the chat and then I'm going to ask people. Okay. To, if you still have time, I'll oh, ask yeah. people whatever, to... Whatever works for your schedule. All right. So this question is, um, we, we're all familiar in our club with milkweed because we love monarch butterflies and we want them in our yard. Um, we have heard that tropical milkweed is inappropriate for our yards. Um, I don't know if you would like to comment on that, but also... We'd like to know how can we tell um, if we already have the plants in our yard, how can we tell apart tropical milkweeds and native milkweeds? Okay, this is, this is a great question and something that at the LA Times, one of you probably knows the answer to it. Let's see today. I don't know the days of the week anymore because we're all messed up with this virus. Thursday. So we're, we're Thursday. <laughs> Around maybe Friday or something, there was a nice full page thing in the LA Times on your, that was your very question. Okay. okay. But I, but I, but I read it. So I know the answer to that, to that question. So I'll tell you that, but that's a good thing to consult. And if you don't get the paper, like I guess still get it in the driveway and go out and pick up the paper every morning. If I you get don't. It on, yeah. You, we get it online. Yeah. You probably can access it that way, but apparently growing the tropical one is not that good because it stays um, green all year long and you encourage the butterflies to stay here in the winter when they should move. That's one, one potential problem. The other is that uh, there's, there's some kind of uh, internal parasite that's a protozoan that apparently will grow on that plant if it stays vegetated for a long enough time. And this is something bad for the butterflies too. Um, so if you have the tropical one, which is called uh, Asclepius, I think it's Curasavica. And what I would do is I would go on something like uh, Cal Flora oh, yes. or something like that. And then look at a picture of, of that, of that playing. If you have that and you like it, I think you can still grow it. It's just in the winter time, cut it down to the ground. That's what, so what you don't want is to have the, the, them, them laying eggs and making larvae all winter long. And they don't, they don't that, that kind of messes them up apparently. But what about the protozoa? Um, yeah, I think that would help working against the protozoan by getting rid of all the vegetation. Cut, oh, it, cut, it, okay. cut it down really low, almost to the ground. Okay. And, and then a better solution is to not grow that species but grow some other ones, such as the ones that would normally live around here. And I think that um, we're all trying to do it right. And we're, we, we, yeah. we, we're people with really good intentions. We were doing one thing and then we learned something 
And now we have to give up something and, and switch to something else. And I'm learning these things, these things too. And so um, I'm going to try and grow some of these other species. And I'm just about, I'm going to start them in some pots. And then I'm going to make a little part of my yard with just these plants and see how it, see how it works. But um, the, the Times article mentioned three or four um, species yes. and you can and go to your to your uh, the nursery and look and just don't get the curasab the curasabica one um and then or you can buy uh potted plants at i bet a lot of you are familiar with the theodore Payne foundation and i go there and get stuff and and so um they would have those kinds too okay excellent yeah. excellent those are all my questions i am inv i invite uh members who want to ask Jim a question, please unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask a question if you have one. Uh, before it gets too crazy, I just want to say, Jim, wow, this was a terrific presentation. Oh, good, good. Beautiful Absolutely. pictures. You must be the most wonderful photographer and just great information. And I will for sure be pestering you every time I find a bug I don't know about. Okay. Well, a few of those pictures I stole from my friends or, or, uh, or off the internet, but I tried to write down that they came from somebody, but I do take uh, something I've done for a long time is take arthropod uh, pictures. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. another way it's another way to do one of those things that we humans we like collecting things that's another homo sapiens characteristic and <laughs> we can collect things in pictures too not we just can. on kids yeah yeah and you so, also asked really quick why do they call it the pygmy blue it's because it's so small that's all oh all right but yeah. what about the blue part because oh blue the the in those group of butterflies they're called very cleverly the blues um <laughs> the they're fairly sexually dimorphic and the males are covered with um shiny blue scales oh okay you've okay. seen them we have other kinds in our yards too so watch out for them usually they rest with i can't do my arms like they rest with their wings up but mm. if, you, if you get to see the dorsal surface of the wings on the males there it's a it's a light sky blue very shiny almost metallic yeah nice thank you i have a question yeah. okay can i ask Please, Charlene. Okay, I just wanted to ask one question. Up in Santa Paula, they have a bug farm uh, that's been there since the 18, late 1800s or 1900s. Do you, uh, is that still in operation? Oh, I don't know. Now, when you mean a bug farm, do you, is, it, well, is, it a, is it a place you go visit? Or? No, yeah, you can visit it. You, they, breed, uh, they breed primarily good bugs, and they started it out for the farmers. Okay all the farming industry and i've been through it and i it was years ago and i wondered if they were still in operation because it's extremely interesting and they yeah, do i i don't yeah. know okay. yeah okay I'll may, may i jump on charlene's question here uh what about the idea of buying bugs be they ladybugs or mantids or or even certain kinds of snails and bringing them into our garden. Do you have an opinion about that, Jim? Yeah, so if you, you can go to the, like my, one of my nurseries, they have ladybugs, ladybird beetles. Um, you can go get one of those, take it home and let them go. And it's totally all right, but they're gonna just fly away. <laughs> and so, so what I would say is if you have those, those if you have those food insects for them they're already there if you if your yard is a good ladybird beetle yard um they will already be there they will find your yard if it's if it's not by buying those they just fly away and go find a good spot okay so, so me i would skip the ladybird beetle one um the mantid one they they're not going to go as far because they don't fly until and only the male of ours the males are the only ones that would fly um and so you could get one of those they i sell those they're called oatheke two o's t-h-e-c-a and that is an egg mass and uh but but they're all over too my yard's full of those things particularly when i i trim the i have lots of elm trees and they're they're stuck on the branches those things are there um already i would just when they show up in your yard don't do things to discourage them so um by say spraying your if you spray your plants 
to get rid of uh, aphids. aphids or something <laughs> like that, you're going to also be harming what mantids happen to be there. And so now you've discouraged them from, from being in your yard. Okay. So um, I don't grow the prettiest of vegetables, but like I said, I share with the, the, the <laughs> other things. And I just, I just don't use any um, pesticides at, at all. I just don't use them in my yard. And there are, but there are things and I can see some questions over here. Um, like I just physically remove things. So if, if I used to have, uh, say, uh, kind of think of the, I'm trying to think, what's the big flower that we put in our hair that people put in their hair in Hawaii? Hibiscus. Hibiscus. Yeah. So I had a hibiscus plant in the past and it got this giant white fly on it. And I would just hose the heck out of it right. with, uh, with water in the nozzle, mm -hmm. mostly just for sport. But then I got tired. I got tired of it. You know, you can keep their numbers down, but I just quit it and get something. I got switch plants. Um, and, and then, but most of us have a yard that's not so big that we can't physically remove things. So if you um, have big caterpillars um, on bushes that are eating the plants, you can just remove them by hand, take them, throw them in the neighbor's yard. Um, if, <laughs> if you have chickens, um, Give them to the give them to the to the chickens, and you can physically remove move stuff. You you would only have to resort to more sophisticated things if your yard is so if your yard is so um, so big. Okay, people. Anybody have another question for Jim? I just wanted to add the uh, article you were talking about in the Times on butterflies was in the Saturday section. Oh, okay. Great. But it was. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I read that whole thing. I thought it was I thought it was good and I learned things. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have I I'm getting grubs underneath my tree. And one year I had so many and I had sprayed and I got rid of most of them. But all of a sudden, uh, I mean it's been years since I did that, but I'm still get, now I'm getting but something eating uh, big digging holes all around my tree I don't know if it's a I don't know what what's eating those grubs I'm, I'm sure that's what there's that's still there yeah I, I think the best culprit for those are skunks oh so, okay. yeah so they they've hit my yard in the last week or so because the soil is is soft um, and they they'll dig these little pockets you know yeah. about a, a cone shape about the size of your of your hands and so yeah. one of the things that they're getting are, are beetle larvae. I showed you that one that's in the compost pile, but we have other thing, other related beetles that are smaller than that. And they're, they're scarab beetles and their larvae are in the shape of a C. They're pretty fat looking. Mm. And so they'll, they're getting those. And my yard used to also be full of trapdoor spiders, but the skunks will find those and they will they will find the opening and they will just dig down until they find the spider and, and eat it. And so I, I haven't seen one in a long time. I mean, I know it's uh, the skunk is doing irrigation on my lawn, which is. So yes. Funny. Yeah. They're, they're, that's what I think is doing most of that, that, that digging. The raccoons don't uh -huh. seem to dig up as much stuff, but they'll turn over your pots or if you have a, uh, a bird bath. They get they they put they tip, they bring stuff from farther away. They wash it in your bird bath. They tip it over, um, and uh, they make a mess. And squirrels knock pots off of walls, and uh, so we live with those things too. <laughs> I did have a bunch of I did have a bunch of pots of flowers around the tree, and several times I come back and all the pots are down. Yeah, all of them. So. Yeah, that's that's what they're doing at night. Mm, yeah, I thought maybe I could catch them, but it may be too late. <laughs> yeah, and so that so that's something. It's the opposite of what we're we we were talking about. So we can do things to encourage some kinds of organisms like insects, but then on those things you would want to come up with ways to discourage them. So yes. you so if you have a neighbor that puts out uh, cat food because they want to feed the the skunks and the possums and the raccoons, well now they're encouraging those. And allowing them to build up in higher numbers in your in your neighborhood and causing problems. Okay. So yeah, so that's not a good thing to do. It's like encouraging mosquitoes. I have a neighbor 
that has huge piles of recyclables, bottles and cans and stuff. And he, for some reason, he likes to gather them. He just doesn't seem to want to return them in, but they get <laughs> rained upon and then you make mosquitoes and then they fly into your yard and bite right. you. And you're like, come on, man, Turn <laughs> <laughs> stop encouraging this stuff. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. Yeah. But most of the things in your yard for, for mosquitoes is, is like have a bird bath, just dump the water out every few days. Okay. Or I just spray it so hard that it, it replaces all the water and look for things that can that have standing water and just dump them out. And once you dump them out and it dries, you're done. It's fine. Well, they, they also said if you have saucers underneath your plants, yes. they, like to, they like to lay their eggs on there too. They do, but... Is, but you have to you'd have to maintain the water there for several days for them to go through their life cycle. If you okay. don't let the water sit for that extended period, then they can't do it. Okay. Which means you it's it's more work for us though. We it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we like our plants. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I. Right. We, all appreciate your your talk today so oh, my pleasure all right we'll let you go uh, unless you want to stay for the burbank valley garden club meeting uh I, i'm supposed to meet students that are picking we, cause since I'm, I'm doing an entomology class this semester and they're still doing an insect collection but mm -hmm. most of them they don't have their equipment yet okay so, you go help those yeah, guys so I got, they're supposed to come here and pick some stuff up and all by 12 or anything like that all right yeah all right so sounds thanks. great thank you i do want you to come back and and talk to us again this sure. has been great thank yeah then i can i can tell some bunch of my hilarious funny jokes in front oh. of everybody which don't work on the zoom meeting <laughs> terrible <laughs> all right thank all right. you thank, thank you, you. Bye -bye. all right everybody have a good day Thank you, Jim. And everybody, we're going to start our regular meeting now. Um, you can unmute yourself. Um, Noella, thank you so much for picking such a terrific uh, speaker.